I'm John Daniel of the Commonwealth of Learning, and I'm with Tansri Raj Danarajan, the President Emeritus of Wawasan Open University, who was my predecessor at the Commonwealth of Learning. And we're going to be talking about uh, this very uh, trendy subject of open educational resources. Um, I believe it's an important development, but perhaps the first thing we should talk about, Raj, is whether it is an important development. You've looked at this. I mean, do you think this is yet another educational technology fad, or do you think there's something real there? Well, John, I hope it's not a fad. Uh, certainly, it has created a buzz, at least in some circles, over the last last few years. My, my sense is it is another asset. Yeah. Uh, now, how uh, the higher education community especially uh, wishes to use it or is able to use it is the bigger question. Um, I, I mean, if, if one looks at uh, the way uh, Matsura, uh, I, I hope I got his name right, defined it as part of his uh, uh, big picture uh, description, he talked about shared knowledge is uh, the valuable knowledge. Mm -hmm. In that context, any any educational resource that's made available for sharing without handcuffs or leg irons attached to it has got a value. My only uh, uh, concern would be uh, having an asset. An asset only becomes valuable if we know how to use it. Yeah, and that's yeah. been the kind of challenge I sense we certainly are confronting in Asia. It's a little uh, uh, comfortable for people like you and I to, 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 to mourn that some technologies are not being used. Uh, maybe in the context of formal uh, higher education, especially uh, institutionalized higher education or higher education from public institutions, um, the, the usage of e-learning uh, has been rather limiting. Private enterprise had made greater use of it in terms of their training, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, corporate training issues and all of that. Even in, in, in Malaysia, there is a good example. I think the, the growth of Islamic banking yeah. has meant uh, a whole uh, a way of uh, doing business, uh, doing a business of banking and retraining people who are trained in the other way of yes, banking yeah, yeah. has had become a, an issue and a fairly big issue. Uh, Central Bank of Malaysia set up a training institute yeah. and they've gone on and to use to use quite a lot of uh, uh, at least digitize uh, learning resources for their training purposes. So you do get some successes uh, but not necessarily from the communities that we, you and I have been yeah. dealing mostly with. Although I think actually that, that one can argue that Asia will be more successful with e-learning. Uh, John Bagley has just written a book in which he argues that because in Asia the traditional forms of open distance learning and the newer forms coexist, people still remember the lessons they learned in the traditional mode, whereas in North America, there are lots of people who think that ODL began in sort of about 1999 <laughs> with the internet, yes, yeah. and have, have completely forgotten all the lessons we learned about how to do ODL. D yes, uh, and, and, and John uh, Bagley uh, perhaps is a little bit more flattering than I think the situation <laughs> for <laughs> I, I, I think while, while uh, uh, Asian distance education enterprises have had a, a reasonably good presence and I think we're looking at 70 or so open universities and mm -hmm. in excess of, of what, what 15 million yeah. participants. The quality of those ventures, especially in the teaching and learning interface, does not uh, give me uh, confidence that uh, transforming themselves or using uh, e-learning portals, uh, digitizing information, will help the, 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 the learner, the, the autonomous mm. learner, yeah. uh, the self-learner. Uh, where we have been able to get away with is, is simply through the fairly heavy intervention of uh, the human support. Yeah. I think the Asians make up for the deficiencies of their learning materials 
through tutorial. By, by lots yeah, of, absolutely, by lots of human absolutely. Yeah, now, yeah. how could you do that in a in an e-learning environment, which one assumes that open educational resources, uh, in some sense, is 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 beginning to signal uh, that social learning, autonomous learning, taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 if unless unless the product unless the materials have a capacity to help, uh, I can I I fear that uh, it'll be just either text or a, a, a resource that may not have the quality of instruction that some of us yeah, may right. desire. You know. Well, certainly, I mean, on specifically on open education resources. Uh, the Commonwealth of Learning has now made quite a commitment to this. I think we're the only intergovernmental body that has a formal corporate policy on it. And in a number of our programs, the Virtual University for Small States, the Commonwealth, we've got an open uh, schooling project with five African, one Caribbean countries doing a whole senior secondary curriculum as OERs. There's this TESSA project, which we're small players in, which is reaching hundreds of thousands of African teachers. Well, and that one in a way shows that it, this, can, this can work. But I, I think the jury is still out to some extent. But as you say, I mean, I think in Asia, probably the first use will be for institutions to get hold of of, of better materials or incorporate better materials than they might develop themselves. Yes. I suspect we're some way from students putting together their own a la carte curriculum by grabbing um, o OERs off the web. I mean, I suspect that's true everywhere, but probably particularly in Asia where that's not yet an idea that's, that's very widespread, I don't think. I think agencies like the MQA, the other watchdogs of the ministries of other education or higher education have all uh, consumer interests in mind when they, when they regulate. They, they also inhibit uh, innovations that the institutions can bring about. And uh, in that sense, uh, educational systems are probably a greater inhibitor of innovations in terms of uh, uh, teaching and learning and self-learning than one would wish them to be. Yeah, uh, you've looked at the, the the sort of state of play of open educational resources in Asia a bit. And what did you what did you learn from that? We are, we are still uh, beginning to uh, analyze as the data, and uh, from what little we have found so far. The, 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 there are maybe about four, if not five, uh, different uh, dimensions that uh, requires perhaps even further drilling. Uh, the awareness and knowledge of open educational resources and their usabilities uh, certainly is not widespread, uh, even uh, at the level of institutional heads. And I'm thinking specifically of institutional heads of institutions like uh, Wawasan Open University yeah, and yeah. other open universities. They, 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 they are not aware of what the resources are, how they can be put together to make a meaningful, uh, cohesive uh, course of studies leading to programs. So awareness in terms of that is uh, lacking. Awareness in terms of uh, the conventions governing intellectual property rights is also missing mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in, a, in a very big way. So that's the first uh, difficulty. The second difficulty is infrastructure. We are looking mm -hmm. at uh, uh, the, the IT infrastructure. Well, close to about 1.5 or even nearer to 2 billion Asians have access to the internet Access doesn't necessarily mean widespread penetration. No, That's no. being very much an urban phenomena. Yeah, yeah. Uh, coupled to that is the size of the pipes. Uh, you, uh, the, the pipes that are available uh, in terms of speed and, and, and volume or whatever is also also limiting. So we're not not able as a consumer of resources to be able to sitting in front of a of a, of a, of a computer and saying I can get this in a snap. You yeah, have to be yeah, house. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, discouraging. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, uh, while uh, internet access is there, we also uh, are a little uncertain as to uh, how e-ready 
many of our nations are. Other than the, the high income countries like Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, and Taiwan, as well as Singapore, the middle income and low income countries, uh, their, their, their e-readiness status and rank seems to be somewhat poor. Uh, they are in the lower half of uh, 100 countries and the upper half of the, of the, of the uh, 100, while the five nations that I spoke of, they are somewhere in the top 10. So there is this disparity. So in the lower income countries, OERs are much more a sort of specialist thing for teachers that's who have the bandwidth if rather they have than the, bandwidth, the general that's public. Right. Yeah. Uh, and even there, there, isn't, there is a lack of capacity in terms of e-learning itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so teachers can have access to it, but if they're going to be using it, uh, for example, if I were to download a, 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 a YouTube, YouTube yeah. video and incorporate it into my, my, my lesson or whatever, the capacity of our, of our learners to, to learn through that medium yeah, uh, okay. is also. So there are some, some, some gaps here. If you have infrastructure problems. We also have uh, policy issues. No institution in Asia, other than maybe some in Co South Korea, have yet a policy declaration. Mm -hmm. I should compliment the Commonwealth of Learning, by the way, for coming out with its policy statement on open educational resources. Uh, talking about institutions in Asia, none of them, perhaps a few in South Korea, uh, have institutional policies governing uh, an approach to, to, to OER. And that's further exacerbated by a lack of policies at a governmental level. Yeah, yeah. So many of these countries have signed up to the Creative Commons uh, con con Convention. So you put all of them together, and then you see what are the practices. There are attitudinal difficulties uh, in terms of, you know, uh, if I were to use, I just give you a couple of examples. If I were to use open educational resources and incorporate it into my lesson, will my colleagues respect me? On the other hand, if we have uh, uh, good textbooks, in, uh, just like a conventional system, mm -hmm. where teachers would find that they could actually uh, strip and assemble uh, such textbooks, I mean, if it's under the CC by yeah, kinds yeah, of licenses, yeah, yeah. which they could, then you are getting a, 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 a taking another step in 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 unbundling uh, certainly the the rigidity of a published textbook mm -hmm. uh, and putting in place uh, both um, the, the open textbook as well as additional resources. It's going to be an evolutionary process yeah. gradually. And, and it's not just the developing world. Yes. I mean, uh, California is a sort of peculiar place because it's, it's meant to be very rich, but in fact is on its backside in terms of yeah. government finances. But Schwarzenegger, one of his big things was, you know, open textbooks. And I saw some figures somewhere that by using OER-based textbooks, the state of California was going to save $350 million every year on the cost of sex books, or the people of California were, which is not insignificant. But I, I do take your point about the difficulty with teachers because we've been running this project called Open Educational Resources for Open Schools with Seychelles, Lesotho, Botswana, Zambia, Namibia and Trinidad and Tobago. Now, and it's been difficult, not through any lack of willingness, but the teachers had to do this on overload, which is so often the case when they're asked to do new yes. things. And as you can imagine, you know, the, the connectivity in, in Zambia is not the greatest. No. However, um, because of the extreme toughness of, of my colleague Francis Ferreira, who <laughs> operates this, <laughs> I think we've got there. We've got yeah. pretty well the whole thing now yeah. available both in print and so. in e-learning mode, some of which has also got some quite nice multimedia with okay. it. So um, it shows it can be done and of course we're very keen that the developing countries be generators of OERs and not just consumers and that some of their OERs go, uh, go around the rest of the world. Oh, that will be ideal and in that sense uh, I am r rather thrilled by the, the efforts of the African Virtual University. Uh, they are putting together and putting out there uh, a slew of teacher training materials under an OER banner mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, with full CC by licensing. Uh, and, and then I think uh, the AVU has had its share of difficulties, but if, if they get this act right, uh, their value given their, their, their uh, access to most of sub-Saharan sub Africa and the many languages that they use would make a lot of difference, certainly in Africa. And I've seen some of their materials. It's very helpful materials, very similar to the Commonwealth of Learning stamp materials. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, that can be made available through. Yeah, which has <laughs> now got a new lease of life, really, yes. under the, under the, because that started in your oh, time. Oh, absolutely. And, and now, now has a new lease so, of life so under the, this, this. So thing. OER is a new buzz. Yes, it's a new terminology. But some of us have been doing this without calling it an open yeah. education. No, <laughs> no, that's right, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, learning. I mean, the, the, the African Virtual University is a wonderful example of people uh, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Yes. As you know, it was set up on a crazy yes. Western World Bank model and that's was right. almost about to go under. Yes. And then this rather good new leader sort yes. of had the sense to take in a yes. good direction. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we, we're the, the other area we're using it is in, you started in your time, the Virtual University for Small States, <laughs> which 10 years later is now beginning to get traction. Yes. And 32 small countries are, are sharing stuff and adapting it, and it's all quite promising. But, you know, it's still, I think, we're, we're not there yet worldwide, no. but what you've said is, is very encouraging. Uh, is, there, is there a lesson there? I think, uh, I mean, if you take the, the story of the virtual university, it would have been easy for the Commonwealth of Learning to give it up, but it sustained its energy and its interest. Uh, and that's really the value of the Commonwealth of Learning. Yeah, it, it no, it, I learned that. both yeah. at UNESCO and, and at Cole that, that you've got to take the long view in yeah, development yeah. because often just at the moment you're, you're thinking of cutting something because it's not showing much progress is actually the moment when it's taking yes. off. Yeah. And I've been very lucky in having some very good sort of thinkers on that. Yeah. So I think that, that I hope that's been a useful exchange uh, for the wider world about this trend which we both think has promise but will need a lot of work of open educational resources well absolutely right john you know from a flunky retiree to one someone <laughs> who might be retiring <laughs> <laughs> and might join the club as another flunky <laughs> oh, yes it's a nice way to finish this conversation good okay well thank you very much <laughs> thank you very pleasure much to be here in again. and enjoy the rest of your stay in penang <laughs> So we hope you found that uh, a, a useful discussion on open educational resources. Watch this space because you're certainly going to find uh, open educational resources at a theatre near you. And I hope they will be useful in your own work in education, whatever and wherever it is. Thank you. Thank you.